Hey, good morning and welcome everybody to BC308, our course on Revelation and Daniel. Uh, trust all of you doing good. I'm doing fine. Thank you. Um, let's take a moment to pray and we will start. Could one of us please lead the class in prayer and we will get started. Who would like to pray? Um. Go ahead, Asha. Go ahead. Let's pray. Thank you, Patrick. Dear God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your love and thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives, God. Lord, as we are about to study the book of Revelation, that you fill us with your wisdom and knowledge, God, and also I pray over Pastor Lord that you continue to pour out your spirit as you teach us and also over my uh, beloved brothers and sisters in you, Lord, that they will understand the deeper level and thoughts that you have to say today, God. Thank you, Lord, for everything. We pray your peace and your blessing, and we pray that uh, you fill us with understanding as we learn and dig into your word, God. Thank you so much for everything. We pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay. So we were in Revelation chapter 3, and we had paused uh, at the end of uh, verse 6, where we uh, just uh, were thinking about, uh, are we looking at the church in Sardis? So essentially, the first three chapters of Revelation, the Lord Jesus is speaking to John about the seven churches, which were in Asia at that time. And so he's addressing each of those seven churches. And we are looking uh, at uh, just just in a sense of you know what what was what was going on in these churches and uh, we're trying to draw lessons and insights from it for our own selves personally and also for uh, the churches that uh, we would be involved in if we could uh, in some way pray along those lines and also um uh, and also you know if, if we are in leadership then of course there's more responsibility for us to address these matters. So uh, we will pick up from verse seven of chapter three. Um, uh, we'll, I'll, I'll do a quick highlight once we're done with the, these, uh, these seven churches. We've got two more churches left. So we'll just finish them and just uh, uh, point out a couple of highlights uh, in, in, in what we are seeing in the Lord's address to these seven churches. So let's begin, please, from Revelation chapter 3. Let's read verses 7 to 13, please. Somebody could read that. Or, or we can take turns, sorry. Um, each person, three verses. Yeah. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he... Rever uh, Asha, you are in the book of Acts. <laughs> Revelation three chapters. Uh, Revelation three verse seven. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write: This thing says, He who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David. He who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Somebody else, please. Because you have kept my commandment to... 
because you kept my command to persevere, persevere, I, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has a, has a year, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Mm. Thank you. Um, just some quick observe, you know, things that I want to bring our attention to. It is very interesting in in the Lord's address to each of the seven churches, or in in, in what we're seeing here, um, we see something very uh, uh, some you know patterns that are repeating to each of these seven churches. The opening statement, opening statements are made by the Lord. Uh, so that's the Lord speaking. So he introduces himself, the Lord Jesus introduces himself to the church in a particular way. Um, but then the closing statement is, let him who here has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. It's very interesting. The Lord Jesus begins to speak. The ending is, hear what the Spirit is saying. Right? To each of the seven churches, it's a pattern that's repeated consistently. And that's that's beautiful because it's it's exactly what Jesus said the Holy Spirit will do. In John 16, 13, Jesus said, When the Holy Spirit comes, he will take what I am saying and speak it to you. So that's exactly what's happening. The Lord Jesus is you know introducing himself. I am, and he describes himself to each of the seven churches in a particular way. But when the message is ending, Hear what the Spirit is saying. Right? So the Spirit and the Lord, the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus, they're saying the same thing. So when we say the Lord Jesus says, or when we say the Holy Spirit says, it's always the same thing. The Spirit and the Word always agree. Another quick thought here is this, that in each of these seven messages, the beginning the angel is addressed, and we said that represents, that is the leader of the church. But in the closing, it says, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So every message is first presented to the leader, the messenger of the church. But then in closing, it says, hey, this is for all the churches. So it's not just for that particular church. In other words, you and I sitting here today, okay, it's for us too. Yeah. Uh, and also putting it back in their, their context, while the Lord is addressing the messenger, the leader of the church, look, you are responsible, I'm speaking to you, but it's also for everybody else in the church. So it's not just the, while the leader is, primarily accountable and responsible, which is true because the Lord has put them there to shepherd God's people. Yet the message is for all the churches. It's for everybody in that church as well as everybody in all the other churches. It's very interesting that pattern is followed um, throughout. The last thing I want to point out, again, another pattern that we see in all of these seven churches is Every time the Lord begins to speak to each of these seven churches, after he introduces himself in a particular way to that church, the first thing he tells each church is, I know your works. I know your works. For all the seven churches, the same way he starts. And that's something to think about, you know, because we would have thought he, he would be looking at our faith or our love or, you know, maybe something else, you know. Oh, I know your faith. I know how much, I know your love. No. 
all seven churches, he starts by saying, I know your works. It's very interesting. And, you know, I wish we had plenty of time to sit down and chew on each of these things. But uh, maybe I'll, 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 I'll take a, take, we'll take a few minutes, okay? So why do you think, what is the significance? Why would Jesus say to each of these seven churches, the first thing he says, I know your works. I mean, why wouldn't he say, I know your faith, I know your love, I some some other quality. But he's saying, I know your works, especially uh, you know, when when we understand grace. Uh, and uh, yet the first thing he's talking is, I know your works. That means he's watching what we're doing. Why was why is that very significant? We'll just take a few minutes, you know. I, I, I know I'm kind of pressed for time here, but uh, let's see. What are your thoughts? Okay, say go ahead, please. Um, I, I just wanted to make an attempt. Um, I, I believe Jesus wants to show us that um, he's a rewarder of men. And um, he wants to show us that um, there's nothing you do that goes on or wears. Um, in other words, there's nothing you do that is being neglected if it's good, if it's unto him. And there's nothing you do that is wrong that he will not he will not uncover or he doesn't know. So I think he wants to raise that consciousness in us that whatever we do, he sees it. He sees everything. He sees all that we do. Mm. And if it's unto him, unto his glory, he has a reward for us. If we mm -hmm. do something, if we do it wrong, and if it's wrong for wrong motive, or it's unto the devil or unto ourselves, then there's a repercussion. So I think Jesus just wanted to establish that there's a reward system in this kingdom mm -hmm. that either rewards good work or um, gives you the consequences of doing bad works. Mm -hmm. uh, good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I see, I see the comments in the chat. Tarun says the works represent faith. Uh, Abni, sorry, Charles says, uh, yeah, the works an expression of love and faith. Abni says works we do in faith and works that manifest His glory and grace. So works is an expression of faith and also reveal His glory and grace. That's Abni, Kennedy. Um, the churches were not operating under grace. And obedience of God. Okay. Right, Christopher, you raised your hand. Uh, yes, Pastor. I think uh, this is where uh, God is, um, you, know, uh, you know, actually sort of emphasizing the, the, the responsibility that the church has um, in, in ministering as well as, uh, you know, conforming to uh, what he wants. Um, uh, what, I mean, what what is is godly, and um, in some ways um, uh, there is this distinction between you know the church uh, as as a body and and individuals who are who are uh, you know uh, getting getting you know getting their grace uh, through faith and therefore you know you know achieving salvation, but the the distinction is that both these are the individuals, but there's the church itself. That is um, has this responsibility to um, uh, you know to uh, to actually minister and um, uh, do do it in in the in the in the right way, and um, uh, that's that's demonstrated by the by the works that the church is performing. Uh, so yeah. Mm. That's, that's yeah. My point. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing sharing your thoughts. Yeah, just to, uh, I just I think you know, kind of just in a sense of what everyone has shared, um, works are important. Works are very important. Uh, 
because it's works that are really an expression like i think many of you have shared it you know they what really they they what really the works are what really show or demonstrate our you know what we have in our hearts right faith by itself is useless because faith without works is dead same thing with love or you know everything god has given to us if it doesn't translate into action then it's just contained inside of us it's really you know we, we don't know whether it's there or not right so works are very important that's why you know for each of the seven churches the lord starts his first sentence is after he introduces himself his first sentence is i know your works however uh, uh, the next thing the the related thing that we need to also mention is in each of these seven churches he says i know your works but the works have to be balanced out or it has to be held together with this and that's something uh, you know it's very interesting to go look at in each of the seven churches if you want to quickly summarize that you know for the church in ephesus your works has to be balanced out with your first love for the church in um, Smyrna, your works have to be balanced out with your enduring persecution. For the church in Pergamos, your works has to be balanced out with holding on to sound doctrine. Uh, to the church in Thyatira, your works, they have to be balanced out with uh, making sh sure you entertain or you platform only the right people. Uh, to the church in Sardis, your works has to be really balanced out with doing the works God wants you to do. Uh, to the church in Philadelphia, he says, I know your works. That's the church we're looking at right now. But I want you to uh, continue to keep my word and hold strong to my name and also to persevere. So your works must be held together with you, holding on to my word, um, holding on to my name, and persevering. And to the church in Laodicea, which we will see later on, works must be held on to a proper estimation of your spiritual life. Okay? So it's very interesting to observe it, observe this. Works are important, is looking at it, and you hold it you know, in balance with the other things that are going on uh, in our Christian life. So the church in Philadelphia is, is uh, I think, you know, of the seven churches, it's probably, you know, uh, you, we would put it like, okay, number one, top on the list, because uh, there is no rebuke to this church. He doesn't tell them to repent of anything. And uh, what, we, what, what can we see here is that this church has been firm in holding on to his word and uh, holding on to his name. And... Um, and uh, so that's a hallmark of this church. They've held on to his word. They've held on to his name. And because of that, the Lord is promising them certain things. He's saying, I said before an open door, nobody can shut it. Meaning you are going to keep growing, advancing. Nobody can stop you from moving forward. Second, this church, like the church in uh, Smyrna, was facing opposition from a similar Jewish group, people who call themselves Jews and were persecuting them. But Jesus just calls them the synagogue of Satan. And uh, uh, to the church of Philadelphia, he says, they're going to come down and bow at your feet, meaning you are going to conquer them. You're going to overpower them. So, you know, amazing promises to the church in Philadelphia because they have held on to his word. In contrast to, if you look at the church in um, Pythir, uh, in uh, Pergamos, they compromised. They were letting false doctrine come in. The church in Thyatira, they compromised. They were letting you know this false prophetess come in. Uh, the church in Sardis, they had uh, you know really weakened, diluted their grip on things that they have received. But this church in Philadelphia is they're holding on to the word and to the name of Jesus. So you see. This is a key, you know, key thing that we need to do. Hold on to the word of God, 
hold on to the name of Jesus that's going to put us in a place of great strength where even those who oppose us will come and bow before us and it's going to enable us to keep advancing Jesus says, I'm setting before you an open door nobody can shut it right so if you put it in perspective today in today's world uh, I'm talking about the Christian church um, there are some subtle ways in which the church is actually deviating from the Word of God. When I say the Word of God, I mean the Scriptures, the teaching of the Word, the the the, the depth in the Word. You know, sometimes we've you know we've got uh, sermons being preached that uh, you know you're like, you're wondering, okay, and I'm sitting here listening to this thing for you know twenty minutes or thirty minutes, sometimes forty minutes. How much of it is the teaching of the Word, and how much how much of it is just some other general, you know? nice things that make people feel good and whatever you know and you, you know it's a, you know the key to being a church like this church in philadelphia is hold on he says keep you have kept my word verse 8 that's the key holding on to that the truth of the god, of the word of god as given to us hold on to it hold on to his name and then uh and he says, you've kept my command to persevere. So they've been just staying the course. They've been enduring. You know, they've been pressing through time. They've stayed consistent through time. And so consistency is where real strength is. It's easy to be, you know, like a shooting star. You, you know, you, you're, you're there for a brief period. But here, this church, verse 10, you've kept my command to persevere. Yeah. They've, through thick and thin, they've gone, they've held on to God's word, no compromise. So these are the three things we see here in this church in Philadelphia. They held on to the word, to the name of the Lord, and they persevered. And as it's a lesson to take away. And then he's giving them the promise, I will keep you from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on it. Now, the only thing we can think of, the hour of trial that will come on the whole world is what we see described later for us in the book of Revelation. Right? Now, of course, the things that, starting from chapter 4, are things into the future and starting from chapter 6 which start talking about the tribulation are all out in the future but the promise given to the church in Philadelphia is a promise given to all the churches across time and so whichever part of the church the body of Christ I mean that are there on the earth at that time this promise applies to them. He will keep us from the hour of trial which comes upon the whole world, which will then describe for us in Revelation 6 onwards, because those are things that affect the whole world. He says, I'll keep you from that. I will preserve you from that. That's his promise. Right? And then he also says, I'll write upon you the name of my God, which is God's own mark of ownership, God's own God's own name, you know, that's that's powerful. His mark of ownership and his identity being put upon our lives. We belong to him. The last church, we just want to go through this, so we'll then move on to chapter 4. Revelation chapter 3, let's read from verse 14 through to 22, please. Three verses each. Revelation 3, 14 to 22. Revelation 3.14 And to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm, lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Verse 17 on somebody, please. 
uh, because <clears throat> because the OCS term rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, I know it's not the who are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that the woman is to be rich and the white raiment that the woman is to be clothed and that the shame of the nakedness do not appear and anoint then eyes with eyes slave that the woman is to see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So. This is the church in Laodicea. Again, this is just our our observation, right? I'm not I'm not trying to be judgmental or anything, but it seems like this was the church that got the strongest rebuke from the Lord. Right? And we're going to look into it. But I want to just point our attention first of all to verse fourteen. Uh, uh, in Jesus' introduction of himself, he says, He is, he refers to himself as the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, the Amen, we understand, that means he's the culmination, the, the fulfillment of everything. He's a faithful and true witness, we understand. He was the one who came, uh, he lived and died. He pointed us to the Father. We understand that. But this phrase, the beginning of the creation of God, is, is very, very, we have to be very careful. Because it has been misused, especially by you know cults like the groups like the Jehovah's Witness, where they can they use this verse to talk about to refer to Jesus as a created being. Because it says here, he's referring to himself as the beginning of the creation of God. Oh, look, Jesus was a created being. No. It's a statement. But you, know, you, you can restate it in different ways. But what's, what is he really meaning? He's meaning he is the source of all of creation. He's not meaning he's a created, he's the first being to be created. So we can take the phrase, the beginning of the creation of God, and we can restate it in different ways. So the Jehovah's Witnesses would say, hey, look, he is the first person to be created by God. No, 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 no. That's not what he's saying. When he says he's the beginning of the creation of God, it means he is the origin, the source of all of the creation of God. And this is consistent with the rest of scripture, right? John chapter one, verses one, two, and three, we all know it. Uh, you know, uh, all things were made by him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Colossians 1, 16 and 17, all things were by him, for him, and through him. So that is what it means. He is the beginning, he is the fountain, the source, the origin of all of the creation of God. God. So that must be very clear. Otherwise, some people will misinterpret that that phrase. Charles, thank you, Pastor. I'm looking at the uh, Colossians chapter one, verse fifteen. It says, "Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature." in line with uh with what you are trying to explain to us uh on the subject of uh christ being created as others are taking it how would you explain uh such a statement uh, peter tells us that we need to stand be able to explain 
So how would you explain if the Bible says the firstborn of every creature? Mm -hmm. So how would you do that? Yeah. So uh, we, uh, um, I'll just refer you back to our notes. In our sec, uh, I will I will explain it now as well. But I will also reference refer you back to our notes in our first year course on interpreting scripture. Uh, at that time, we did in the last section we addressed this phrase "firstborn," right? So if you look in the notes there, you'll find it. But I'll just repeat it. Um, so this phrase "firstborn" is used in many ways in the New Testament. And when it's used in respect to Christ, it's talking about him being, for example, uh, uh, in his incarnation, he's referred to as the only begotten of the Father. In his resurrection life, he's referred to as the firstborn of the Father, of, of, of those who are from the dead. So both these phrases have to be understood correctly. The only begotten, in his incarnation, the firstborn with respect to him being with this resurrection. Okay, so keep that in mind. There are these two phrases in New Testament, only begotten, used in the context of his incarnation. Firstborn, used in the context of his resurrection. Both these phrases have to be understood correctly. In the light of the rest of scripture that means yes it is open for interpretation but it has to be interpreted with the rest of the in the light of the rest of scripture can i take the phrase only begotten to imply he had a beginning that he was born at some point no i cannot why because the rest of scripture says he was from eternity to eternity first born can I take firstborn, which is used in the context of his resurrection, to mean that he was created at some point? No. What, what is it implying? Firstborn means he is the first person to be raised from the dead to live eternally before the Father. So everywhere, Colossians 1, uh, Revelation 1, wherever you find the phrase, you know, Revelation 1, verse 5, again, it's used, firstborn from the dead. So everywhere this phrase, firstborn, does it mean he had a beginning? What it means is he was a first person, human, to be raised, to live eternally before the Father. That's how this phrase, firstborn, is used. So uh, our response is saying these phrases like only begotten, firstborn, they have to be interpreted in the light of the rest of Scripture. What does the rest of the Scripture say about the same person, Jesus Christ? Does that help, Charles? It does. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. So, yeah, so... Um, that was what we were saying, um, Revelation 3.14, the beginning of the creation of God. We have to be a little careful how we interpret uh, these phrases. Okay, So now let's look at the church at Laodicea. What was their problem? The problem was they were self-deceived. I mean, if you were to sum up their problem in one word, it was self-deception. So wh why do we say that? Because they had one estimation of themselves. They thought, like it says here in verse 17, they were rich, they were wealthy, they didn't need anything. You know? So they were having this, you know, super impressive self-estimation of themselves. We are rich, we've got everything. We don't need anything. And of course, in spiritual terms. But the Lord is saying, in that same verse, actually, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So this is a clear example. This is a 
classic example of self-deception. Self-deception is, we think we are something that we are not. So this church was thinking, oh, we are rich, we are wealthy, we don't need, we don't lack anything spiritually. But the Lord is saying, hey, spiritually, you're in a very bad place. You're poor, you're wretched, you're miserable, you're blind, you're naked, meaning you've got nothing. And because of this self-deception, they are in a place where spiritually they are lukewarm. They're neither hot nor cold. Basically, uh, they are beyond cold, you know, so to, so to speak. I mean, they're, they're lukewarm. And that's why when, he, when the Lord rebukes them, he says, be zealous and repent. Meaning, you got to rekindle your zeal. Be zealous or become zealous. Rekindle your fire again. So, self-deception led them into this place of complacency, being lukewarm. But yet they thought everything was okay. So, what does self-deception do? It leads us into this place of being lukewarm, of being complacent, no zeal. But yet we don't know there is no zeal. We think everything is okay. So what, what is the Lord telling them? He tells them in verse 18, I counsel you. Meaning, look, this is what I'm telling you. Buy from me. Now, think about that phrase. Buy from me. How can you pay God money to buy something from God? So, what does he say? I want you to pay the price. So when he says, buy from me, he's saying, I want you to pay the price. So you see, this church had reached a place where everything was so easy. It thought it had everything. There's no longer paying the price. So he says, I'm counseling you. I'm telling you, buy from me. Meaning you've got to pay the price. Pay the price for what? He says, I want you to buy from me. Look at the three things he tells them. I want you to buy from me gold. I want you to refine in fire. I want you to buy from me white garments. And I want you to buy from me uh, uh, anoint your eyes with anointing. Three things. Gold, white garments, anointing for revelation. Now, obviously, these three things are representing something. Gold, what is of true value. Gold refined with fire. Gold represents what's divine, what comes from God. So he's saying, I want you to pay the price for what is what comes from me. What is divine, what comes from God. Gold. You know, in contrast to if you look at First Corinthians 3, Paul tells us, you know, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Wood, hay, stubble are, you know, the things of this world. They just burn away. But gold, silver, precious stones, those are, those are what comes from God. Those are what is divine, eternal. So I want you to buy from me what is really the true riches, what comes from God. I want you to pay the price for it. Second, I want you to pay the price for true righteousness. White garments represents the righteousness of the saints. Pay the price for true righteousness. And third, I want you to pay the price for true anointing that brings revelation. Because he says, you know, your eyes are blind. 
and you need anointing to see yeah anoint your eyes so you can see so to pay the price for anointing that brings revelation so think about the church in Laodicea and so he says I want you to be or become zealous stir up your zeal rekindle rekindle your fire and then it gets even more shocking that's verse 20 because in verse 20 Jesus is standing at the door and knocking which means he is actually outside he's been locked out he's no longer there inside He's outside the house. So can you imagine a church where Jesus has been locked out? So this is of course, he's speaking to the church, speak, and, and the church of course is made up of people, individuals. And say, I, I want to come in, I want to, you know, I want to, Eat with your fellowship with you. I want to I want to be inside. But right now, he's outside the church, he's knocking. I want to come in. So in their self-deception, which has led to complacency, them being lukewarm, they're not paying the price for what is true riches, true righteousness, and true anointing that brings revelation. They're not paying the price for that. What has happened? Jesus is outside the church. But the church is functioning. They think, hey, everything is really good. We've, we are rich, we are wealthy, we don't need anything. That's how the church is going on. They think, we've got everything going. Yeah. How's the church? Great. You know, how's, how's, this, how's the fellowship? Great. How's the service? Oh, it's wonderful. Everything is good. But Jesus is locked outside. You're poor, wretched, naked, blind. You don't know that. And you've stopped paying the price for what is really from God, true righteousness and true revelation. So he's saying, but you know, look at his look at the compassion of Jesus. He's saying, look. I'm standing and knocking, meaning I want to come in. I want to be in my church. I want to come in. And if anybody, anyone, even one person in this community is going to receive me, I'll come in, I'll fellowship with that person. That means he is the true riches. He is that true revelation. He is that true righteousness. Now, I'll come in. I'll I'll. I'll fellowship with him so you know this last church is a strong warning for us like you know all the other churches there's a lesson to take away from each church we should never ever come into this place of thinking everything is great Because that was the problem. They thought they got everything. Hey, we don't need anything. Everything is perfectly fine. No. We cannot do that. We have to always be paying the price for what is coming from God, the true riches, true righteousness, and anointing that brings revelation. Always in that posture of paying the price, of buying from Him. And you're paying the price for what comes from him. And always stir up our zeal, keep our zeal on fire for the Lord. Okay, any thoughts, any questions, please, before we jump into chapter four? Charles, you have something to say? Yes, Pastor. Um, I'm looking at this buying and um, 
referring to <clears throat> Isaiah 55, mm -hmm. uh, where he says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth come ye to the waters, and he that has no money, come ye buy and eat. You come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Mm -hmm. And now, um, here in the book of Revelation, he is saying buy gold. Mm -hmm. um, it is, I, I wanted you to shed more light on here in the book of Isaiah. I was looking at even Isaiah 61, verse 10, where he says, um, he's going to give us the raiment of righteousness and all that. But when I look at 55, verses 1 and 2, uh, it is talking about food, it is talking about uh, water, milk, and but when he comes here, he is talking about when you come in verse 18 of chapter 3, he's talking of gold, something that is now um, remaining, something that because in chapter 55 of Isaiah is water, you drink it, is gone, milk, you drink it. Food you eat it, but now he's talking of gold, he's talking of clothes. So um how how can I translate it? I was mm. looking at it about buying without price, but this time is wanting us to pay price. I don't know how to express it, but I'm there in the middle. So Pastor, if you could intervene. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's pretty simple, right? Think about it all in spiritual terms, right? So think about the act of buying. When you buy something, in the natural, when you buy something, you're paying a price. Now, in the spiritual, when you buy something, you pay a price, but it's not a natural, it's not like you're giving God money, but it's paying the price spiritually. What do you mean paying the price spiritually? It is our seeking God. It is our you know, through our prayer, through our seeking God, through our diligent following of God, that is paying the price in a spiritual sense. And all of these elements that are described in Isaiah 55 and here, they are only representative, whether it's milk, whether it's water, whether it's bread, whether it's gold, whether it's white garments, or whether it's, you know, anointing for your eyes, they are representing something. These elements, all of these are just representing something, right? So when you think about water and milk, don't, don't think about literal things. These are pictures. They are representing spiritual nourishment, spiritual things that God gives to us. Similarly, when you think about gold and white garments, don't think about natural things. These are representing spiritual things, right? So what is the, 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 the understanding is pretty simple, straightforward. It simply means we pay the spiritual price to receive these spiritual things from God. That's all. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other any other questions from uh, or any comments about the church in Laodicea? Okay. So, we're going to get started with chapter 4. I know it's already one more minute to 9.50. But let me just introduce. Chapter 4 begins like this. The Lord Jesus says to, you know, he, John has his experience. He sees the door opened and the voice says, come up here. I will show you things which must take place after this. So this is the dividing line. This is things to come, things yet to come. That's why we say chapters two and three were things that were that were at there at that time. So Jesus says, you know, in, in chapter one, he said, speak to the seven churches which are in Asia. So he's not talking, you know, about some church in the future. He's talking about church right there. These were seven churches that were there. So till chapter end of chapter three, he's speaking to those seven churches which were there. Chapter four was one is into the future. Okay, so let's pause 
Uh, we'll come back in 10 minutes after the break and pick this up. Okay, thank you.